Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you today, God, so humbled by your presence. Lord, I just ask you that you would just begin to minister through me today, God. God, let them not hear my voice, God, but let them hear your voice. God, I just ask you that you would just begin to minister to your people, God. Pour out an anointing among all these people, God. God, the message that you prepared in my heart, God, I just ask you to lay it on their ears, God. Lay it on their hearts, God. God, when they go home, they go changed, God. God, I just ask you and I just praise you, God, just to be with me tonight, Lord. Lord, I just ask you to calm my nerves, God. God, let these sweats go away, Lord. Lord, but I just praise you and thank you for who you are, God. God, the God of all gods, God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I'm just so thankful and just so just blown away by who you are, God. God, calling me, God, to just be your, your servant. In your name that we pray, amen. I don't know about y'all, but it started getting real hot in here really fast. And I hope that I wouldn't be on stage tonight. I wore my pineapple shirt, and I hope it wasn't elegant enough, elegant enough for the pulpit, but Pastor Mark told me that I was going to be up here anyways, so we ended up, up behind the pulpit. But it's so good to be here. Um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Isaac Savage. Um, I've been going to Lexington Church of God for probably close to like six or seven years now, um, and it's truly an honor just to be down here, and I'm so thankful for Pastor Mark letting me come up here and speak. Um, I remember when I started coming here in middle school, we had just moved from upstate New York, very close to the Canadian border. And so when we moved down here, I wasn't, I wasn't used to the Southern hospitality. I wasn't used to Southern church. And so when I come into this church and Pastor Mark would get up there preaching and screaming and it was just crazy. I wasn't used to it. So coming, coming to this church and really getting plugged in, it's really changed my heart. And I'm just excited at the fact that God's called me in a ministry um, as Pastor Mark was saying earlier, I was called to ministry when I was in the eighth grade. Um, actually, the summer of the eighth grade, transitioning into high school. It was kind of crazy because I told God, I was like, God, you know, you called me at what seemed like the most inopportune time just due to the fact that I didn't even know who I was. You know, coming from middle school, I was one of those kids that would never stop talking. And so I understood why God called me to ministry, but not why he chose me. Um, I, I tend not to stop talking when I'm in class, when I'm around other people. Uh, sometimes my mom even says I talk in my sleep, so talking kind of is just in the blood flow. And so when I was called to ministry, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't quite prepared, but I was, I was excited. And, and so something I'm going to be talking tonight just a little bit about is just about a little bit of dreams. And so something I just I wanted to share before I even got started was, was where I was freshman year of my high school career, really wasn't sure where I was going. I knew that God called me into ministry, and, and Lee University started getting spoken in my heart. So I said, you want to? We'll look into it, and everything fell into place, and I got accepted to Lee University, and I was thrilled by it. And so it's just crazy to think that all through my high school career, God used me and placed me in strategic moments to be able to impact my peers, impact the teachers. And it was just really cool how I just, I watched God use me and use me and use me. And so then finally I get to college and I hear about this thing where you can actually get your, your license. And I was, I was blown away by it. I was like, this is, this is crazy. And, and so it turns out that in, in four months, what a little dream was four years ago turned into a reality. And in four months I'll have my exhorters license for the church of God, which is just beyond me. It's it, mind blowing. And so I just couldn't help to think. I was, like, I was like, God, you know, this is just crazy. And so I was like, God, how did I get here? And I just began to reminisce on it. And I was, and I was thinking, I said, God, you know, Miss Denise had sent me a Facebook message and asked me when I could speak. And, and so I, I immediately I said, God, I, I want you to lay a message on my heart that, that just burdens you. I said, God, I want you to hurt my heart. And so I had prayed that message, and I said, God, I just I want to feel what you feel. And so I, I prayed that message, and and not anticipating how hard he would make my heart hurt, but I would walk out of, the, out of my dorm room, and I would look around, and, and my heart just began to hurt. And it's not like one of those hurts that just, like, hurts. It was like hurt, hurt. Like, I was like, oh, that, what's going on? It's one of them little cramps. And so I was sitting there, I was like, I was like God, what's going on? Why does my heart hurt so bad? And so as I was looking around, I was like, God, I don't get it. And as I began to look, I started going from church to church. I was trying to find a home church in Cleveland, Tennessee, and as I was looking, I just, I noticed that the fact that the authenticity of the church in today's time is not at all where it should be. You know, Pastor Mark was talking about, he almost prefaced my whole entire message before I even got up on stage. But just the fact of the matter is, is no one truly seems like they're godly creatures. And I know I'm saying that as a broad statement, but it's, it's almost like we forget that who God is as a, as a God. You know, a lot of times, there was a, 
we'll have like a, a little moment where we say, yeah, we're Christians. And if you can put that first picture up about the, yeah, there it is. So I, I began to look and I said, you want to, I want to know what the, I want to know what Christians have in America. So if you look up on the screen, you'll look and see 73% of Americans identify as Christians, which blew me away. Now this was in 2016, but two years, well, I guess 2019, three years ago now, you'll see that 73% identify as Christians, 20% no faith, other is 6%, and then 1% is not sure. And so I was like, well, praise God, I had no clue that we had this many Christians in America. So if you'll put this second picture on the screen for me. Now here's what blew me away at the fact of the matter is, is how Christians affiliate with Jesus. If you look over there, the 41% are non-practicing Christians. And so you might ask, what is a non-practicing Christian? So that is atheists, agnostics, or people who don't identify with 60% of the criteria that Christians are supposed to affiliate with, which is studying, reading, worshiping, and going to church. Four things, so 60%. So basically, they had to identify with like three things. And so if you look, 41% of that, 48% of those Christians are, are, are post-Christians, which is alarming at the fact to think about that 41% of that 73% isn't, isn't even living a life full of Christ. But only 31% is living a life of Christ. And as I began to think about that, I was like, I was like God, how? God, why? Your Bible clearly states that if you are a lukewarm Christian, that you will be spewed out of his mouth. But here we are as a generation, as a whole. Now, this is taken out of 5,137 people. And that ranges from all ages. But the fact of the matter was, is that less than half don't even, don't even uphold the criteria of what it means to be a Christian. And so as I was sitting there, I was just like, I was like, how? And so I went from church to church, and, and mind you, Cleveland, Tennessee is the, is the Church of God capital of the United States. The international office is seven minutes away from in a car, and it's 15 minutes to run. I've ran there. And so the fact of the matter is, is that when I went from church to church and I walked into churches and never once did I see the Holy Ghost moving, never once did I hear the word spoken with power, never once did I ever see people introducing themselves to me. I went to one church, this church is supposed to be the capital of it, and I got touched one time and I went to three services. But see, the issue is, is, is not only, it, it, people make mistakes, it's not a big deal. But at the same point, if we're Christians, we're supposed to love like Christians. We're supposed to love like Christ. Every single day when we walk around, we should be noticed that, hey, he's a Christian. Like Pastor Mark had said, do your very best. And your very best is making sure you're talking to every single person because I believe wholeheartedly in divine intervention. And whether or not you believe it, every single moment that you're on this earth, you have an opportunity to speak life. I walked around and people asked me, Isaac, why are you so happy? I've said it before when I spoke last time. It was just due to the fact that if my smile could touch somebody's life, I was pleased with it. If my joy could touch somebody's life, I was pleased with it. And I'm not here to brag on myself, but at the same point, it's time for us to wake up as a generation. It's time to wake up from all ages, from babies to adults, and you just better praise Jesus for who he is. You know, the more and more that I thought about it, I was just like, God, I just don't understand. What can we do better? And it's just, if, if you just get away. And so if you'll open up your Bibles with me to Daniel. We're going to start right there in the first chapter, so you ain't got to turn far in Daniel. Daniel was, Daniel was cool to study. I, as I was preparing for this message, I said, God, I want you to give me someone unique. And we all know Daniel. Daniel was in the lion's den and how God had shut the mouth of the lions. But I went just a little bit deeper in Daniel. We're going to start at verse 8. And so... King Nebuchadnezzar had sent out this big decree, and he said, he said, I want you to go find all these young boys who look good, are wise, basically just like a, a mirror of me. And so they was wise, they were smart, they dressed nice, they looked, all, the, whole, the whole shebang. They, they just wanted Isaac Savage, and luckily I wasn't there during that time. But Daniel was the next best thing, in my opinion. And so... What they had did was they, they, they wanted to use them, so they said, you wanna, I want, I, we're going to serve you the king's delicacies. And so this was some steak and some wine, and so they was eating good in my opinion. But Daniel said, 
I can, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's eating. And so when we pick up in, in verse 8, it says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. So you see that Daniel's beliefs were to not defile himself with the king's eatings. And so since he was attempting to stay faithful with that, God had given him the compassion and the, faith and the favor so then that he wouldn't have to do that. So when he talked to this chief, th th he was like, hey, you want to know what? This is my child. So it was, almost like, it was almost like I think about it that Daniel had like this, like, you know how we think about like an angel, like the little yellow aurora around him? That's all, and then like the, ah! yeah, when they looked at Daniel, I, I just imagine him like that in front of this chief. And then it says, and the chief of eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youth who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head within the king. So basically he was just telling Daniel, hey, look, if I give you this and you look worse than everybody else, I'm going to get in trouble and then I'm going to be beheaded because of you. And so that's a pretty profound statement to me just because of the fact that he was like, look, I, I get it. But at the same point, I'm worried about covering my own head. I'm worried about covering my own behind. So if you'll stay tuned and listen, then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let, your, let our appearance and appearance of the youths who eat of the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. And so... I don't want to take it out of context of what it is, but I almost want to take it just a little bit out of context. And I want, I want to replace the, the king's delicacies with worship, prayer, and studying in the word. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we continue reading. Just think about instead of the food, think about worship, studying, and praying. And so, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were in better appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward t took away their food and their wine, and they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So this is like preface to what Daniel's going to end up doing when he interprets King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But if you'll notice that when they took these 10 days away from all these other foods and they just began to eat vegetables, you see how their life immediately began to change and they were fatter and fleshed than all the other kids when they were supposed to be eating delicacies of that time. And so when we think about it, just how as Christians today didn't identify with 60% of that criteria, no wonder that this world looks like it does just because of the fact that they're not upholding what the fatter foods would look like. So these vegetables, or in our cases, the word praying and studying, it, it just it shows the fact of the matter is that if we would just take 10 days out of our time, and I'm saying that we're supposed to do this every day, but just 10 days, you'll notice that your life will radically change because in one aspect or another, God will begin to just shift the way you think. And as soon as he starts doing that, that's, that's kind of when things can start to change. Those finances that you were worrying about, those things that at home that you're worrying about, those things at work, people not getting along, you, you'll notice that immediately in your life things will begin to change, and then you don't know where it's coming from, but if you'll notice that you just took away those, those other things in this world, stop watching so much TV, stop playing so much video games, stop playing whatever you do in your off time, and just took this time away and consecrated yourself and let it God just speak through you, and let God just be able to minister to you in your own way, and when you're alone and secluded, you can't tell me that you won't be changed. The praying aspect of your life is huge. The worship time is even more big. Same as praying. And then the studying time, you can't know a God that you don't even understand in the first place. So how dare you call yourself a Christian if you can't even say that you know who they are? It's like being married to someone, and when they ask, hey, what's my favorite color? You're married to them. You probably should know that answer, and then you don't even know it. The true aspect of it is that today as Christians, we lack in the thought that we need this. We think if we go to church every Sunday morning that we're good to go. Maybe we go on Wednesdays too. So two days out of a seven-day week that we don't even give, that, that's the only time we give a God who created you. He knew who you were when he hung there on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
I just wish that we had a generation that would just rise up. And I don't care if it's a mixed generation. I don't care color. I don't care age. I just wish we had people that would just acknowledge who God was and what he stands for and would uphold it and lift him up and be able to just speak through us. You know, a lot of times, and I'm not ratting on you guys for doing this, but a lot of times you rat on our generation and you rat on generations prior to us. And believe it or not, Y'all's generation was ratted on by the generation before you guys, too. So it's just been like a ratting on the next generation for a long time now. But if you realize that if you'll partner with us, because we're creating things that you guys weren't able to create, and that's not saying nothing to you guys. Technology is just advancing. People are just advancing. We're understanding even more about human behavior than we ever have. But if you just partner and just say, you want to know it? You came from the same place that I did in your mother's womb. And you came from the same father. Adam and Eve created it also, no matter what, we're under some sort of bloodline. But sometimes we can't get it through our heads that no matter what, we need the next generation. As much as I don't want to, my little brother, one day is going to be smarter than I will ever be. Just due to the fact that when time progresses, he'll be able to understand things that I was never able to understand because one day I'm going to die and he's going to continue living, God willing. And then his children, and then my, it's just a continuous process. But if we can work together and understand that we need to do this, that's where things happen. And so picking up where we left off, the wisdom that was given to them, the wisdom that we can take away from this, of just staying and just sitting with God for a little while, and just, I'll tell you what, before I got to Lee, I didn't have nearly as much study time just because I was busy doing other things. I wasn't, I wasn't too worried about this. And so the fact that I was able to actually force to have study time because I was taking Bible classes, so I had to study. I'm not saying that's a good excuse. But when I sat there, I just noticed things in my life started shifting, and I, I understood God in a whole new way. And I said, I said, God, I'm getting so much closer to you. This is great. It's, and then I started to, when I started preparing for this message, I realized I'm getting closer to him because I'm learning more about him. So as, as he's drawing me near, I'm, I'm pursuing him. And so when I'm going to all these churches and hearing his word from all these different people and going from every ethnicity of a church that you could think of and enjoying it and really soaking in and hanging out with people who are older than me and people that are younger than me, and learning from them has been crazy. You know, one of my little, to get off a little bit off topic, one of the coolest things at Lee is sitting down with a professor who has spent his whole adult life learning about the Bible in ways I could never imagine. And then I wonder why, how he can quote all these scriptures so well. It's due to the fact that he spent time consecrated in the word and God anointed him to touch these people. And although teachers in our today's time, in our schools, although we can't talk about Jesus, but you can love like Jesus did. And you can help like Jesus did. And no matter what, you can hold these kids that when they go home, although they might be abused at school, they can feel loved. Or when you're in your workplace and you, new people walk in, I dare you to step out and say, hey, how are you doing today? Start the little conversation. Those little things matter to people. Every time I go to a new place, I just look for the nice people. Going to a college, when I tell you I didn't know anybody, I truly mean it. I knew maybe one person. There's 5,000 people at Lee. So I went, I even had a roommate across the country. My roommate's from Maine. And I never met this kid. I actually, I didn't even text him until the day I moved into my dorm room, an hour before. But the fact of the matter was is that he loved like Christ did, and he welcomed me, and I welcomed him created a world of difference. When I met all these other people at Lee, it created a world of difference because when I walked in, they loved like Jesus did. And it created a community. And then we wonder why everything looks so set apart. It's because Jesus is working so strongly in there that we can no longer ob obtain in, inside this world of worldliness and we have to be secluded. And so then next thing you know, things are happening and, and chains are dropping and all these things are just crazy to me and mind blowing, but it's just because we're loving like Christ. And so it doesn't only have to be like that at my school. I don't want it to just be at Lee. I would much rather walk out into the world and be happy. I don't want to watch the news and see things that happen to other people. I want to see people loving like Christ did. 
My favorite thing to watch in the news is when a disaster sets place. I hate disasters with all my heart, but I love the community that happens after it. So why in the world does it take a disaster to create a community? Because if you truly think about it, although this warfare is happening in real life, you guys have no clue the spiritual warfare that's happening behind our eyes because we refuse to open them to the bad things that are happening inside people's heads. Suicides need to stop. Depression needs to stop. All these things need to stop, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that we won't come together and work together and love like Christ did. We won't get it secluded so then we can become more like Christ. Let's move on. We're in verse 18 now. At the end of time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all, all of them, none was found like Daniel, Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. For, for, therefore, they stood before the king. They didn't look like everyone else did. When I, when I was called into ministry, the person that had prophesied over me, he said, Isaac, you're going to feel lonely. Isaac, you're going to feel like you have nobody. But you run, and you run as hard as you can. You pursue Jesus with everything you have. Because one day, no one else will understand. But one day, God will set you apart and will light you on fire, and you will go places that you never thought you could be. Sometimes we struggle with the loneliness of being alone. I know what it's like to sit in a room and, and you're the only Christian and say, oh, you're a Christian, you can't drink. Or when you walk in a room, things get awkward because they were talking about things they probably shouldn't even been talking about. When you walk in a room, they're, they're quickly hiding things in their bag or they, they try to, they cuss a little bit and then they, oh, oh, sorry, you're a Christian. But the truth of the matter is, is they have a twisted vision of who Christians are. They think that we're gonna judge them or something, but that's just because of who we've associated ourselves as. But what they don't realize is, I don't care that they cuss. I don't care that they do those bad things because I'm going to love them anyways. And if anything else, I'll show them the love of Christ so that one day they can truly understand that Christ loved them no matter their sin and they can walk out of that life and be able to be, be made new. But until that moment that we start setting ourselves apart and truly loving people, they'll never feel like that. They were set apart among all these other young boys. I bet you they felt a little bit lonely there. Although they had each other, it was just a small group. But the fact of the matter is, is that one day they would never realize how much it would pay off. The miracles that were performed over these four boys' lives, the three other ones except for Daniel were thrown in a furnace. Daniel was thrown in a lion's den. And if you'll notice, all of them were still living after the fact because they were set apart. Because they trusted God. They understood that no matter what happens here, I'm going to continue to live like I know how I'm supposed to live. I'm going to continuously live right by the Bible. And that one day, whenever I need to, I can stand before men and I can say, you want to know what? I don't care what you say. I'm a child of God and I'm continuously living how I'm supposed to live. So picking up back up in verse 20. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times... Say it with me, 10 times. Better than all the magicians, enchanters, and all were in his kingdom. So when we're thinking about it, in verse 20, when it says the magicians and the enchanters, those were supposed to be like the king's most smartest people. Like those were like the professors today, the teachers of today, the, the geniuses, the signs. Those were... The, the king's smartest people. And the fact of the matter is, is they weren't just found one time. I've noticed that God's not a God of just one thing. God is a God of many things. So he doesn't just do it one time. He does it ten times. So it's moving from one digit to two digits. And although that it, it doesn't sound like very much because we use ten times, we can say a hundred times, the fact of the matter is, is they weren't just a little bit smarter. They were far smarter than all the people that were supposed to be smart. And then to finish out the verse, and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. So if you guys will skip over to verse two, or chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. And so at this point where, where we're at, just I didn't want to give us too, many, too much scripture. We've run out of time. King Nebuchadnezzar had had his dream, and he was freaked out about it. And so at this point, he said, he wanted to call everyone that was just wise, and he, want, he, he was freaked out. He said, I want everyone. I want everyone to come, and I want them to, I want them to be able to tell me what this dream means. I'm, I'm freaked out. I don't know what it means. I don't know what to do. And so, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is 
sometimes when we have creepy, weird things happen, we can't turn to our friends. We can't turn to our sisters in our phone. We can't call them up at 11 o'clock at night and say, girl, I had this dream. Let me just tell you about it. This, this was far beyond that. This was one of those times where you had that dream at nighttime, and it, and, it, and it woke you up in the middle of the night, and it was just, it was freaky. You were like, God, what are you trying to tell me? And so when he had this dream, he said, you know, I, I'm just, I don't know what to do with it. And David, Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what it is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to, uh, to us the king's matter. And so this was this is what, when Daniel had received what the king's dream, so mind you, the king didn't even tell Daniel the dream. But if you look up here, what, what was just read, he had already received it, and so he was giving thanks to God before he had even went and done the act because he knew his faithfulness was sufficient. He knew that when he stepped into that room to go tell this king, hey, you want to know what? I know what your dream means. And so the fact of the matter was is that that set apart led him up to this point of being able to be successful in something that all his smart people weren't able to think of. So in verse 27 through 28 it says, Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show, up, show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. And so it goes on to read it. And so the, the fact of the matter was, is it, if you want to read it in your off time, but I just wanted to point out the fact how Daniel was faithful to God and how he was able to work inside of him and just be able to move in his heart and show him all these things. And then how it paid off when he told King Nebuchadnezzar his dream. It's a big deal to me that in today's time that we understand that these dreams, in a sense, are things that we can tell the whole world about Jesus. And so you might think, well, it's not a dream. Well, the thing is, is a dream, it could just be a word. And so God put inside of us this word that we want to share with the whole entire world. But the thing is, is we have to be willing and understanding of God and be willing and understanding to take up our crosses and follow him and be able to tell the whole world who Jesus is. You know, I, I tend to think about the times that I struggled to understand who God was. And I struggled to understand where I was going and what path I was supposed to be taking. And I can imagine that Daniel was the same way. But when I think about it, I just have to remember that, you know, no matter what, no matter where I'm going, that God has already let, numbered my path. He knows where I'm going. He knows who I am. And he knows that he's going to anoint me to do whatever I need to do. And I want all of us today to understand the fact of the matter is, is that God does the same thing for you. You know, you don't have to stand up here behind a pulpit. You don't have to. You don't have to stand up in front of the president's office. You don't have to be the church secretary. You don't have to be the associate pastor. You don't have to even be involved inside the church as a, as a, as a paid position or as a position. But the fact of the matter is, is if you would just trust God with your dreams and trust God with where you're going, he's got it all under control. Oftentimes we have to feel like we have to have everything all together, but we don't. Daniel didn't have everything all together. He was just walking and just accepting God for what he was and for who he was. Don't let anyone tell you that you have to be all together because you don't. You know, God prefers broken. Broken's not all together. He would much rather pick you up and be able to put you all back together and use you as he sees fit. But if you'll just allow him to, it is hot in here. <laughs> I feel like I'm shining. But like I was saying, it's just... If you would just let God just use you and let God just be able to minister through you and let God just do as he pleases with you, things can radically be, begin to change. You know, I, I understand why they do it, but in high school, I was, I was faced with the question, Isaac, where are you going to be? Where are you going to go? What are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to do this? How much money are you wanting to make? How, what do you want? All these questions were being asked. And like when people are fixing to retire, Hey, what are you going to do? What are you gonna, how are you going to make money? How are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You know, what's your retirement plan? Are you going to travel? Are you going to do this? Sometimes all these questions, they just begin to stress us out. And I'm sure Daniel was asked all these questions. Hey, man, what are you going to do if these vegetables, you know, don't make you, don't make you look good? 
hey, Daniel, what are you going to do when they throw you in that lion's den? And, and the lions begin to eat you, then what? All the stuff that you preach to us, it, it's just going to be null and void. But the fact of the matter is, is Daniel said, I'm going to trust God anyways. I'm going to continuously pursue God, and I'm going to allow him just to begin to minister through me. And no, no matter what happens, I know that if I, don't, if I don't live to see another day, I know where I'm going. I know who my Father in heaven is. You know, I, I tend to think about the people in the room next to you, on the right, on the left, in front of you, behind you. You know, I was talking about earlier with that graph. How many in here know for a fact which spot that they're in? You know, oftentimes it's terrifying to think about that, you know, you think that you're living the right life, and I pray that you are. But at the same point, do you know for sure? If you died right now, if God decided to take this whole congregation, how many of you would still be sitting in the seat that you're sitting in right now? I just, want, I, I just want to take the seriousness of the moment and just be able to say that, you know, although your situation might seem rough, although that you think that you're doomed, although that you think that my sin is too great for God, my God didn't hang on the cross and then raise three days later for you to say that about my, who my God is. He loves you despite of what your sin is. Who cares if you're an alcoholic? Who cares if you're doped up on drugs all the time? Who cares if you've got a sailor's mouth? Who cares if you have su suicidal thoughts? Who cares? Because you want to know what? God loves you despite all of your sins. He sits there every single day, and when you're supposed to be hit by this car, God said, not yet. He protects you. When people pray over you as an individual, God's like, come on, just come back, just come back. I just, I, I, I'm so burdened by the thought that if we would just love like Christ loved and just did what we were supposed to do, these generations wouldn't be fighting anymore. We wouldn't have to worry about government shutdowns. We wouldn't have to worry about choosing political parties. We wouldn't have to worry about all these things because division is what causes all this chaos. You know, these racial tensions, they shouldn't be here. We should be able to be gathered in a church where Asians are here, where white people are here, where black people are here, where Hispanics are here. Who cares what you are? No matter what, you bleed the same color. Oftentimes we think of, and we look at people, oh, oh, you're just that. Don't, don't, don't contain me to just one thing. I'm not just that. Daniel wasn't just this kid. If you'll notice that I'm sure that there was elders being like, oh, he's just a kid. He'll learn the hard way. But no, Daniel made an impact. Daniel made a decision that he was going to follow God no matter what the consequences were. And if he were to be killed, you want to know what? That's what happens. But, you know, our God is sufficient. Our God is on time. And he does everything that he says that he's going to do and more. And I just, I just want everyone to understand the fact that matters is that you're important, that your dreams matter. Keep dreaming. When I was in middle school, I thought I was going to be an athletic trainer. Now I'm talking in front of people carrying out God's word. There are days where I say, God, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of feeling like I do. You know, one of my teacher's favorite saying was, everybody knows Isaac. Everybody sure does know Isaac, but no one truly understood who I was. I felt lonely. I felt alone. I'm speaking for a lot of pastors. A lot of people in this room, I'm sure, feel lonely. But the fact of the matter was I said, you want to know what? God, I want to give up so badly. God, I'm tired of fighting this. I'm tired of being like this. I can easily just go pick up a cigarette. I can easily go pick up some drugs. I can easily just go find a party, and I can get wasted, and I can get away. But the truth of the fact of the matter is I know who I was. I know what God called me to be, and I knew I needed to stay on the right path, and I knew I wanted to be exactly where I am in this moment. It's the same thing for all of you. Who, If you feel lonely, press in. If you feel that you can't handle the name, press in. You'd be surprised that when you get away, just the hand of God just begins to just work on you. And so I want to go into Daniel chapter 6, and, and right after I finish this, I'll, I'll be wrapping it up. But Daniel, he was, the cool thing was, is he was chosen originally as a watchman. And so I call it a watchman. The Bible uses a different term. But basically, the king was fixing to separate the kingdom, and he set, set people over certain parts of this kingdom. And so we did this. He set Daniel and a few others as like basically the watchmen 
of these people to make sure that when the king checked in, he would check in with Daniel and say, like, hey, is, is he doing what he's supposed to do? And so Daniel being Daniel, remember, our God is sufficient in supplies. He made plans to place over, the king had made plans to place David, David Daniel, I'm sorry, over the whole entire empire. Because he said, you want to, Daniel's, Daniel's something else. Daniel has something inside of him. He's, he's got something stirring. So I'm going to place him over the entire empire. And so as we pick up in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Now this is the people that didn't want Daniel to succeed. And you'll read this. Then the, then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with the regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. It just blows my mind because if you look, you see, Daniel was set apart, and so he was lonely, but if you looked at his life, his life was almost perfect. He wasn't perfect, but his life almost looked perfect because they couldn't find any fault inside of him. They looked at him and said, okay, well, we can't tell him that he does drugs because he doesn't. We can't tell him that he's an alcoholic because he's not. Everything about Daniel was, was different, so they couldn't find anything. So they found the one thing. That would hinder Daniel. And it says, these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So you know those co-workers at work that make fun of you because you're a Christian? And if y'all don't have them, I do. Oh, you're just a good little Christian boy. What do you know about that? Oh, you're just a good little Christian boy. You know, you're just, just stay in the church and whatnot. And you'll, you'll be good for it. You, you, you won't have any real world experience. Oh, you haven't seen what I've seen. You know, I've, I've been around the world twice. I've, I've done it all from top to They make fun of you. And although you just laugh, oh, man, yeah, whatever. It hurts just a little bit. Because when you want to have friends and you want to go hang out and you want to go do things, but you, wanna, you look at it and just like, you're right, I can't do that because I'm not going to defile myself like you are. I'm not going to let myself ruin inside my own body like you are. Not saying that, that you're better than them, but at the same point, you understand what your worth is. You understand that what Christ placed inside of you is worth something, that you don't want to forsake that. And so as we pick up in verse 6, or 25, I'm sorry. Then King Darius, so once I get to this, so what they did was, is they placed this law in place that basically... This is like the shortcut version. When they counted to three, everyone was supposed to kneel down and kneel down to King Darius and say, you know, and worship him. But what Daniel did was something different. What he did was he went back to his room and he began to pray. He prayed three times a day. And when he prayed those three times a day, he said, he said God, I want you to change the heart of these people so they won't bow down to a worldly leader. He did this three times a day. And so then when all these people that were trying to find fault in him finally found the fault in that because he wasn't supposed to be doing that. He was only supposed to be kneeling down to King Darius. But when they finally found that fault in him, they said, you want to know what? He's supposed to be, he's supposed to be put in the lion's den. And so King Darius was like, no, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. I don't want to put it. Daniel something. He's, he's got something special. If only you guys can see it. And no, if everyone refused to see it because they understood what the law was. So Daniel was put inside the lion's den, and when he was put inside the lion's den, they were, what was supposed to happen was when he was thrown in, he was supposed to be eaten alive right before he even hit the ground. But what you see what God did is when he was thrown into that lion's den, God intervened immediately and shut all the mouths of the lions in that den. Now you tell me how that happens. And so then when he was left there overnight, he was surely supposed to only be bones in there. I'm sure the lions would have still been even chewing on his bones. But when the king ran up in there and said, Daniel, Daniel, did your God save you? And when Daniel cried out and said, yes, king, my God saved me. Not only did he save me, there's not a scratch on my body. Not even his garments were torn. It was almost like these lions turned into little house cats. And they was just messing around, just sitting there, you know, just lounging around, sitting up on the couch in there. But see, the fact of the matter was is what God does is God works miracles. God does bigger things. And so if you'll just stay faithful to him, although these people are saying all these bad things about you, God will eventually pull you out of that situation and place you in a place that you can be lifted high. 
And so when he lifts you up, it's not that you're going to be put on a pedestal, but you'll be higher than everyone else because God's anointing is going to be upon you. And so when you walk in a room, there's going to be like this a little aurora around you that when you walk in, you're going to be, there's something different about him, just like Daniel. There's something different about him. There's something that I can't quite pick it out, but he's happy. He's got joy. He's got love. He's got compassion. He's got peace. How does he have it all together? But it's just because of the fact of the matter is God dwells inside of him. So King Darius then wrote to all the people in the nations and the languages that dwell in the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion people that are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall, never, shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and earth. He, he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions... See, our God doesn't just work in small little ways. He does things that are miraculous. So then, read verse 28, and I just, want, I just want to pick up on just one word. So this, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. If you just read that word, prospered, prosper, prosper means something. He, he did well. He did big things. He did great miraculous things. And although we think we have to be set apart and we have to, you, you do, but you can prosper too. God just doesn't limit you to the one thing that you're capable of. The one thing that I found that I'm good at recently is fixing cars. I like that. I've done well in that. I've learned everything I possibly can. But at the fact of the matter is, is that I prosper in that, but that's just not my one trait. When I fix cars, just like Pastor Martin, I do it to the best of my ability. I do nothing half but. I stand there, and when I fix a car or when I just do the most basic task, I do it to the best of my ability, ensuring that if my own mother was to drive this car, I know she's 100% safe to the best of my ability. When I walk in a room and love people, I do it to the best of my ability. I act like every single person in that room is a family member. A lot of people don't like hugs, but I hug them anyways. A lot of people don't like to be touched at all, but I touch them anyways. A lot of people like to just sit down and, and they, just like to, they just like to sit down and just be quiet. And when they're sitting in the quiet room, they, you know, they play on their phone. And I don't like doing that. That's boring to me. I like to talk. So I go and sit next to somebody and they, they're immediately uncomfortable. <laughs> but it's just due to the fact that I just want to love them. I just want to make sure that when they leave that room, that no matter what, they know that they were impacted by my life. Not because I think I'm important by any sorts, but by the fact of the matter is, is that I know the God that lives inside of me can impact them in ways that are beyond imaginable. That when they feel the love of Christ, that maybe that person was supposed to go home and kill themselves that night, but they said, God, do you want to know what? You send one person to talk to me today, and I'll change my whole idea. God, that one, that one person doesn't have to be me. Don't leave it just to me. I can't, I can't talk to everybody. I wish that I could, but I can't. A lot of people don't even like me, so how am I supposed to talk to people that don't like me? That's y'all's job. Y'all are supposed to help out with this. Don't leave it just to the pastor to talk about Jesus because you know what? Pastor Mark does a darn good job up here every single Sunday and Wednesday. He does it to the best of his ability. But at the same point, he gives that to you. The word is not, it might be for him too, but it's for all of us. Take it and run with it. Tell your neighbors about it. Tell your friends about it. When you get to work, play some worship music. When you get to work, talk to somebody a little bit about Jesus. When you get to work, even if you can't talk about Jesus, love like Jesus did. I can't say that enough. Love. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Social media is the biggest culprit. I just find people like to rant, rave, and do all kinds of things, except for praise Jesus on social media. I can't tell you how many times I have to delete it just because I can't, I can't bear to look at it. But there's an opportunity that... I've had people that liked my post, and I'm not bragging, but I am a, just a little bit because it was the coolest thing in the world. They liked it from different states. I never even met this person from Adam. But at the same point, the fact that my ministry can also be heard around the world, it's not only me. A lot more people have many more friends and followers. It can be shared everywhere. But if you'll just take the time and get alone and be secluded with Jesus... And allow him just to work through you, minister through you in ways that you can never dream possible. That's when change happens. And if the musicians want to come. The fact of the matter is, is it's God loves every single one of you guys. God wants to see you guys prosper. God wants to see you guys do great and wonderful things. 
But we have to get out of our own heads of being who we are and allow God to change us into who we will become. God can minister to every single person through you. That homeless man on the corner, minister to him. I'm going to tell a quick little story. There was one time, I was talking about a homeless man. There was one time I met a homeless man. And I do this little thing. I, I got this from Pastor Mark. And, and it was the coolest thing in the world. I said, I'm going to be just like Pastor Mark and I'm going to do this. When he sees a homeless person, he pulls out his wallet. He doesn't even show him the dollar amount. And I'm just going to pull out one little dollar because that's all I have. And he says, brother or sister, I have money for you. But I can't just give you this money and just let you run with it and go do God knows what with it. I'm an anointed man of God. And I believe that God can do great and wonderful things with this just this one dollar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to pray over this dollar, but I'm going to pray over you as well. And when I hand you this dollar, I want you, whenever you go to spend it on cigarettes or alcohol, I pray that it burns you. That you have to either go return it or you can't even buy it in the first place. That you actually go buy it what you intend to use it for. And either that's for your family or food or whatever you got to use it for. And so then I'll pray over that person. I met this man. His name was Dwayne. And as I prayed over him, he began to weep. And I said, man, this is, this is uncomfortable. And so I sat there and I looked at him and, and he said, you want to know what? He said, I, I'm going to tell you the truth. I asked for this money for food. He said, I'm starving. I ain't had a meal since yesterday. But I just want to tell you, you're the first person that since I've been homeless that has ever prayed over me to be prosperous, that has ever prayed for me to be able to be successful, that has ever prayed and anointed a dollar bill just so that I can be something greater than just homeless. Because sometimes we define these people as homeless, but they're the most wonderful people in the entire universe. They have talents that are beyond us that some of us can't even perform. But they can, but they just had a few little mess ups and society looks down on them and says that they're unsuccessful. Society looks down upon you and says that you're unsuccessful. Society looks upon my generation and says that we're unsuccessful. Society says that these older people don't know how to raise kids. Well, the fact of the matter is, is how about we change society's idea of who we are? How about we raise up God and how we're supposed to be raised up and we actually minister the gospel and tell people about who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Take up your cross and follow him, he says. If you guys will stand all over the house, I'll go ahead and close this in prayer. As I was preparing for this message, every head bowed, every eye closed. As I was preparing for this message, I said, God, if it isn't, if it isn't for a single person in this room, God, I know it's for me. The authenticity of the, is, of the Christian life has to change. Believe it or not, it starts with you and it starts with me. But it's important today that we pick up our crosses and we follow who he was and we follow exactly what Jesus commanded us to do and that was love all people. That when you have dreams, you never let anyone crush those dreams because you are more than who, you, who they say you are. That when God begins to minister into your own heart, that you take that and you run with it and you tell your coworkers about it, that you tell your friends about it, you tell your kids about it. Don't allow your kids to stand there and not feel loved. Love on your kids. Make sure that they know that you love them. Because that same love that they give you, they're going to go out into the community and they're going to share that with their friends. It's a chain reaction. So as I pray, I want you to think about every single thing that burns you up on the inside of your body. And I just want you to begin to pray over it and say, God, that I don't want this anymore. But I, what I want you to do is I just want you to fill me with love. I want you to fill me with grace. I want you to fill me with peace. That when I walk into a room that people see not what burns me up, but they see you above all else. God, I just thank you, God, for this opportunity. Lord, I just thank you for the, the fact of the matter is of who you are. Lord, I just pray that your words went forth today, God. 
God, I just ask you that you would just begin just to work your miracles over your people today, God. God, I just ask you that inside their hearts that you would just begin to permeate inside of them, Lord. Lord, when they go home, that when they have that spare time, they don't sit on their phones and they don't waste it on the sofa watching TV. Lord, that they would just begin to open up their word, God, or just begin to play worship music or just begin to pray. Lord, I just ask you that you would just consume the inner parts of their life, God. God, all the sin that remains in their house, I just ask you that you would just begin just to move it out of the way. Lord, make room for you, God. God, no matter what they do, I just ask you that you would just begin just to work inside of them to find peace. God, let no more child go. God, go hungry. God, let no more child be suicidal, Lord. I just ask you that you would just begin just to work in your own way among the young kids, God, among the middle-aged people, God. God, and among the elders, God, let no one feel lonely because no matter what, we know without a shadow of a doubt that you are here with us at any waking moment and we know that we can trust in you no matter what. God, you are just such a merciful God. Lord, I just ask you that you would just begin just to minister into our hearts, God. God, I just ask you that when we walk into a room, it just burns us up that we're just so filled with smiles and giggles that we walk into a room and then we just begin just to want to seek you, God, through these people that we just tell them who you are and what you're about. That although they might be believers, they can learn something new through us. God, you are just such a good God and I wish that we would just be able to stand here, God, and just understand that, that we can just tell anybody about you. Lord, I just ask you to remove that, that burning inside of our heart for something that doesn't desire you. God, the addictions, I just ask you that would begin to fall. Lord, I just ask you that the thing, the suicidal thoughts and the depression would just begin to fall. God, I just declare in your name, God, that no matter what we do, that we do everything the very best that we possibly can for you, God, because no matter what, we trust and believe in you wholeheartedly. God, we know that we can do our very best for you in every single thing that we do. Lord, whether it just be picking up trash on the side of the road, Lord, whether it just be that we pick up a little gum wrapper in Walmart, or God, it be our careers that we do the very best in. God, let it all bring glory and honor to you, God, because you're the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, and I just truly believe that no matter what we do, if we do it to our best of our abilities, you will be glorified through it. God, let us walk into a room and be different. God, that loneliness that we feel, Lord, Lord, although that we don't want to feel it, it's good, God, that means we're doing something right. Lord, I just praise you, God, and I give you honor, and I give you all the glory, Lord, for who you are and what you've done. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the fact that I, I'm standing up here, Lord. Lord, it's preaching your word. Lord, I just ask you to bless these people, Lord. God, I just thank you for the, the opportunity to be able to, God, let us just be able to stand here, God, and worship to this song. Scripture tells us to come out from among them and be separate. I was thinking as Isaac was sharing, particularly at a young man his age, the pressure to fit in. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego made the conscious decision to be different than the rest of the world. And as a result, God honored them. When they set themselves apart to God, God set them apart from the rest of the world. Listen, that, that, that may sound a little simple. When Daniel set himself apart unto God, chose I'm not going to look like everybody else and I may not fit in, God set him apart. When the times of trial came and Daniel stood fast, when they set him up and set a trap for him and said nobody could bow down to anybody else except for the king, Daniel threw open the windows. In other words, I don't care who sees. I'm not, I'm not hiding my relationship with God for anything or anybody. I've set myself apart to God. God set him apart that day. When the trials came and Daniel found himself in a pit of lions, anybody else would have never hit the bottom of that cave before the lions ripped him apart, but God had set him apart. He wasn't like anybody else. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe tonight that God is trying to set us apart.
because there's a world screaming, screaming for hope, desperate for hope, looking for peace. And you and I, we know the peace speaker. You and I know Christ. When Daniel set himself apart unto the Lord, his diet changed, and it was through that, through what he brought in, that God changed his appearance from the inside out. As Isaac spoke, he said, it's our prayer time, our Bible time, our devotion time. What type of energy are you putting into God? Because we all want everything God has to offer, but are you willing to set yourself apart? When everybody else is watching television, when everybody else is going to the club, when everybody else is doing this, God, I've set myself, I want to please you. I've changed the diet of my life, Lord. I'm hungry for you. I want to know you, God. I want to know you more intimately. I want to know more about you, God. As Isaac said, he, even through preparing for this sermon, as he began to draw close to God, he said, I, I learned more. I felt closer to God. The scripture says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. So I'm going to challenge you this evening. Here we are, January the 2nd, a new year. Consecrate yourself unto the Lord as Daniel did. I want to change my spiritual diet because I've not been partaking of the good things. I've not been in my word. I've not been in my prayer closet like I should. I've not spent time just fellowshipping with God like I should. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm speaking to some in here tonight. You're at a point in your life where you feel like you feel like you're in the pit of lions. And you're pleading for God to rescue you, pleading for God to do something. I've come to tell you, listen, there's still breath in your body. There's a God that says, spared your life, rescued you for such a time as this. But it's time for you to stop playing games with God. Time for you to change your appetite and change your diet. Father, I thank you for the precious blood. I thank you tonight, oh Lord, that you're still raising up an army of young men and women that contrary to what we hear, that this generation behind us, Lord, is so far removed, Lord, the evidence around us is that you're still raising up young men and women with the fire and the passion, the conviction of Daniel. Lord, the tenacity of Joshua and Caleb. The boldness of David, Lord. I know today, God, you're raising up a generation, Lord. And I pray tonight, God, that you would indeed unite generations, Lord. Young to the old, God. Lord, that we would come together and be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. Challenge each of us spiritually, Lord. About what we're bringing in, what we're ingesting spiritually, mentally, and give us a hunger for you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God, give us a hunger and a thirst to know you, to please you, to honor you with our lives. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you give the Lord a praise clap tonight?